I stand with Linda. I stand with Linda. Always. I stand with Linda. As you continue to inspire and work on the efforts of the pioneers, Sister Linda Sarsour. Assalamu alaikum. That was, um, Beautiful. Thank you um, to Isna and to everyone in this room. And I want you to know that my very brief lecture this evening is um, in honor of Hajja Razia, um, who uh, was a pioneer herself, and she was a native of Pakistan and was schooled traditionally at home and held a strong belief in the value of formal education, encouraging of her children to pursue college studies. She was a goal-oriented woman. She taught those around her the importance of love, dedication, hard work, and the respect of our beautiful religion. And Hajjah Razia Sharif Sheikh, there is a scholarship in her name that will provide American and any American student with the opportunity to pursue an education in the field of Islamic studies and journalism at a US-based institution. And ISNA is the one that is coordinating that scholarship. So I am grateful and honored to stand here today to honor a powerful woman who no longer is with us today. Uh, so please me, join me in honoring Hajja Razia and her beautiful family who's here with us today. I also want to congratulate you, Dr. Saeed, for the decades of work um, that you have committed to our community. Um, your name is a household name too. Everyone knows who Dr. Saeed is and I want you to know that us and the generations that come after you understand that we stand on your shoulders and the work that you have done and the infrastructure that you have built for all of us to be proud Muslims in these United States of America. So congratulations to you, Dr. Saeed. And to my favorite person in this room, that's mutual, is Imam Siraj Wahaj, who has been a mentor, a motivator, an encourager of mine, someone who has taught me to speak truth to power and not worry about the consequences, someone who has taught me that we are on this earth to please Allah and only Allah, that we are not here to please any man or woman on this earth. So I'm grateful to you, Imam Siraj, and you might think this is weird, but every once in a while when I get into that deep, a dark place, um, Imam Siraj comes and talks to me. Um, and then he helps me to emerge out of those spaces. So I'm grateful to you, Imam Siraj. May Allah bless you and protect you and keep you for a long time for our community because we need you uh, now more than ever. I just want to say to all of you here today, and many of you have came to, to speak to me during the this ISNA conference, um, and I just want to say to everyone, I'm alive and I'm grateful um, every single day. That's how I'm doing when I wake up every morning um, able to serve our community, um, to see my beautiful children and my family, that I am grateful. So I don't want you as a community to worry too much about me. Allah is the best of protectors. And when I, as long as I can be in spaces with all of you, as long as I can uh, be here for as long as Allah wills, um, I'm grateful for every moment that I have. And I want to be a living lesson for the Muslim community. I want that. I want the challenges that I face to be a lesson to all of you in this room and beyond this room. 
What I believe that people can learn from my experiences is that you can be unapologetically Muslim, unapologetically Palestinian American, hold strong conviction, have strong ideology and politics, and still become a mainstream American who can inspire and resonate with people outside of the Muslim community. I have been able to, to prove the importance of us as a Muslim community standing up for any and all communities who are oppressed in this country because not only is that the right thing to do, it is the Islamic thing to do. I have been able to teach us and our young people that we do not have to give up any part of our identity. I don't have to choose in the rooms that I go into or the organizing spaces that I am in or to meet with elected officials or to sit in, in interfaith spaces. I don't have to choose do I not be too Palestinian this day? Do I not bring up the positions that I have on certain issues? Do I hold back in certain spaces? I have been a living example of what it means to be wholeheartedly all of me in whatever space that I am in. I want people to embrace us all and all the complex identities that we bring to the table. And I will not be in a space where any group or any organization or any individual tells me that there's a part of my identity that is not welcomed into any space. That, my sisters and brothers, is not something that's going to fly with us in the Muslim community. And I want to share some advice to us and some observations in the very short time that I have. I want to talk about patriotism. And that is a conversation that we have in many elements of the Muslim community. I want you, us as Muslims, in particular those of us who are children of immigrants or immigrants ourselves. Patriotism in your home country is different than patriotism in these United States of America. In this country, in the land of freedom of speech, in the land of democracy, Dissent is the highest form of patriotism. So the most patriotic Americans, our heroes, the people that we, we say inspire us, whether it be Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, or Muhammad Ali, these are people who dissented against our government and against the very policies that oppressed the communities that they came from. In these United States of America, if you sit back idly, in the face of injustice, if you maintain the current status quo that not only oppresses Muslims but oppresses black people inside our community and outside our community, undocumented people, other minority groups and oppressed groups, you my dear sisters and brothers are then aligned with the oppressor. If you as a Muslim are standing on the sidelines, if you are neutral in the face of oppression in this country, you are not a patriot, you are aiding and abetting the oppressors in these United States of America. I will not be an aid or help any oppressor in this nation oppress any community by my silence. You can count on me every single day to use my voice to stand up not only to people outside our community who are oppressing our communities, but those inside our community who aid and abet the oppressors outside of our community. There was a man who once asked our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, what is the best form of jihad or struggle? And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, a word of truth, truth in front of a tyrant ruler or leader, that is the best form of jihad. And I hope that we, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad that we are struggling against tyrants and rulers, not only abroad in the Middle East or in the other side of the world, but here in these United States of America where you have fascists and white supremacists and Islamophobes reigning in the White House. Sisters and brothers, we talk a lot about this across the Muslim community. I hear people have this as themes of their conferences, unity. The best weapon that we have as a Muslim community against our opposition and those who choose to oppress us is unity. Unity, sisters and brothers, is not just a word that you use that sounds really nice that you say on a stage. Unity is tangible, it's practical, it looks like something, it feels like something. When I think about the Islamophobes and those who oppose us as a Muslim community, 
they don't actually see differences within us. They don't care if you're Shia or Sunni or Salafi or Sufi. They don't care if you're from Pakistan or from Bangladesh. They don't care what your political leanings are when it comes to what's happening across the world. All they know is that you are a Muslim and they hate everything that you stand for. So if the Islamophobia industry, if those who choose to vandalize our masajids, who attack our leaders, are not asking you what madhab you follow, they, when they attack a Muslim sister, they don't stop her in the street and say, excuse me, before I attack you, I would like to know if you are from Pakistan or Bangladesh or from India. They don't care. So if the Islamophobes are treating us like we are one community, why are we not acting like we are one community, sisters and brothers? Unity is about survival for the Muslim community. We will not survive as a community in the face of more adversity and a potentially horrific time that could come if we as a community are, not, are not united as one ummah like we are supposed to be. I also want to say to you that when I think about us and our allies, because you, my dear sisters and brothers, even if we are to be united, we are not enough. The best estimate that I have for you is that we may be about 5 million Amer uh, Muslim Americans in this country. That's on the high end. There are about 340 million Americans in this country. So you are only 5 million of 340 million. You are not enough on your own. So we can no longer operate from this perspective that we are Muslims and we work for Muslim issues and we want to protect Muslim communities and we think that if there were something to happen to our community that we just by defending ourselves are somehow going to win or be able to uh, push back against any of these policies or moments that could come to our community, that's not going to happen. We need to build coalitions, we need allies. Every single day, sisters and brothers, I dedicate my work and my life to aligning myself with communities who are marginalized and oppressed in this country, building power across communities, introducing people to who we are as Muslims by being leaders in social justice movements, by leading in the resistance to fight for all people in these United States of America. Your deen, our religion, was never a religion about protecting and defending Muslims. It is about protecting and defending all of Allah's creations. Now, if we took all of the opposition and put them together, and we took all of the Muslims and all of our allies and put us together, right? The opposition is not more than we are. They don't have more money than we have. They're not more educated than we are. They don't love their families more than we love our families. They don't love their religious institutions more than we love ours. They don't love their leaders more than we love ours. So if we are not, as a community, we are not outnumbered, but we are out-organized by the opposition. Sisters and brothers, which brings me to investment of resources. And I'm going to keep it real with the Muslim community. Some people like me, some people don't like me. And I don't mind. I love all the, everybody, you, the ones that like me and the ones that don't like me. We have enough masajid in this country. We have enough buildings in this country. We have enough bricks in this country, unlimited infrastructure in these United States of America. So I am doing a call out to you, sisters and brothers, that I understand that people want Sadaqa Jari and you want to build masajid. You will not benefit from Sadaqa Jariya if 40, 50, 60 years from now there are no human beings and Muslims that are praying and worshipping in those masajid if we are not investing in leadership, our next generation, and defending and protecting our deen in these United States of America. So these multi-million dollar infrastructure projects are for me, in this moment that we are in, in this very critical moment, are distracting us from where we really need to put our resources. We need to train our young people. We need to hire youth directors in our masajid. We need to organize and mobilize. We need to do voter registration and voter engagement. We need to build programming in our community. We need mental health services in our community. Sisters and brothers, oftentimes when I'm at a fundraiser, and I'm not saying that we need to choose. So I don't want you to, to say to me, Sister Linda, but you're asking me to give something up about something that I care about to give somewhere else. I'm not asking you to do that. 
A lot of people care about Kashmir, and we care about Pakistan, and we care about Palestine, and we care about Syria, and I care about those communities too, and I care about the horrific things that are happening to our Muslim sisters and brothers. When you're at a fundraiser and you're giving $1,000 to Syria, I want you to continue to give to Syria. I want to continue to alleviate the suffering of our people. But I ask you to say to yourself, I'm going to give $1,000 to Syria. Maybe this time I'm going to give $800 to Syria. And then I'm going to take $200 and I'm going to give it to an organization like ICNA Relief, like ISNA. I'm going to give it to CARE. I'm going to give it to MASS. I'm going to give it to a local organization doing organizing work. work. I'm going to give it to a women's organization. I'm going to give it to a local clinic. Sisters and brothers, we need to diversify our resources and make sure that we are experts and have infrastructure and services in all aspects, not just building masajid, building masajid, building masajid. Sisters and brothers, it's been 16, almost 17 years since the horrific attacks of 9-11. And we still as a community find ourselves unprepared in so many moments. Why, sisters and brothers, why are we so unprepared? Why are we so afraid of this administration and the potential chaos that they will ensue on our community? And we already saw their potential when they come out every few weeks. Muslim ban one, Muslim ban two, Muslim ban three. They are relentless, they are persistent and consistent and want to see how much we as a community can endure and want to see who our friends are and how hard we're going to fight back against this administration. So I ask of you, my dear sisters and brothers, to support a whole range of organizations and services within the Muslim community. When I think about building power, I think about brothers like Abdul Sayyid who is in this room today, who is running to be the first Muslim governor of the state of Michigan. He can't, sisters and brothers, he's a wonderful brother. He's an inspiring brother. He is well qualified to be the next governor of Michigan, but he can't do that without you. You can't just sit on the sidelines and say, MashaAllah, look at that brother, what he's doing. That brother doesn't, not only does he need your MashaAllah and Bismillah and Dua, he needs your money. He needs your support in, in, in deed and in action. And I hope that you have the tangible opportunity here at ISNA to join him this evening at 6.30 p.m. at NBC Suites where he's actually holding a fundraiser. We gotta put our money where our mouths are. He's taking a risk for our community and putting himself in public where he is going to be prone to attacks and he's going to be prone by the opposition and also not just by the opposition, by establishment Democrats who have never really opened their doors for people like us to succeed within the Democratic Party and now we have potential hope in a young brother like Abdul Sayyid and I hope that you provide that support to him. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, I want to also advise us and I'm saying this from a really deep place of knowledge and watching our community organize. We all have different talents. Some of us are religious leaders and scholars and have ilm and knowledge to help advise us in the type of work that we do. Some of us are mental health professionals and social workers. Some of us are media pro professionals and communicators. Some of us are organizers, some of us are health professionals. There's a whole range of skill sets in the Muslim community. So we all have to leverage those talents. We gotta stay in our lanes. If you are not a communication specialist, then you are not to be advising our community on how to communicate with the rest of the public. If you are not a health professional, then you are not to be advising people on how they should be eating or how should we maintain our health as a Muslim community. If you're not a social worker or a mental health professional, you are not to be lecturing me about depression and anxiety and fear within the Muslim community. If you're not a person that has done government relations, then don't tell me how to interact with government if you have never been in that realm of work or do not have that experience. Sisters and brothers, the Muslim community, mashaAllah, I'm so proud of the type of talent that is in our community. Let us leverage one another, let us uplift one another, and let us not try to be the jacks of all trades and the masters of no trades. We in the Muslim community need to think about the work that we do for the betterment of our community. Not because we want to be in certain places or in everything. I know what my role is. I don't lecture people about our deen. I'm not a religious scholar. I don't allow people to ask me my advice about a particular struggle that they're having with their Islam because that's not my area of expertise. I'm not going to be the person to tell you how to run a mental health clinic because I'm not a mental health professional. I'm an organizer. I'm a communication specialist. I know how to do social media and PR. That's what I know how to do. 
So if you know what my talents are, use my talents. When I know the talent, uh, talent of our sisters and brothers, I use those talents. And when we as a Muslim community have leveraged the skills across our community, guess what happened? We win. We have won major campaigns across this country, including incorporating Muslim school holidays within the New York City public school system. That was a campaign that leveraged every community me member, parents, religious leaders, communicators, scholars, media professionals, and that's what we need to do on a whole landscape within the Muslim community. I'll end by saying to you all, my dear sisters and brothers, we have to stay united, we have to stay organizing, we have to stay outraged. Do not criticize me when I say that we as a Muslim community in these United States of America have to be perpetually outraged every single day. When I wake up in the morning and I remember who's sitting in the White House, I am outraged. This is not normal, sisters and brothers. Those people sitting in the most powerful seats in this country is not normal. So do not ever be those citizens that normalize this administration because when the day comes that something horrific happens to us or to another community, you will be responsible for normalizing this administration. Our number one and top priority is to protect and defend our community. It is not to assimilate and to please any other people in authority. Our obligation is to our young people, is to our women and make sure our, our women are protected in our community and our top priority, even higher than all those pr priorities, is to please Allah and only Allah. We are never to cower to the powers that be. We are never to give up any part of our identity so somebody else can open a door for us. If a door doesn't open, guess what we do? We build a new door and walk through our own door because we have that right in this country to also open opportunities for us and other communities. I want to say congratulations to Isna on 54 years and inshallah 54 more years to come. I ask of all of us and recently for those that knew and my new announcement was that I am now the former executive director of the Arab American Association of New York. I was the executive director for 11 years and I could have been the executive director for the next 30 years if I wanted to. It is my organization, I helped build that organization. 11 years later sisters and brothers I said to myself my work is done here. I built the infrastructure, the financial stability. I took an organization from $40,000 to a $1.2 million budget organization. The time came for me to give that organization to new leadership, to new young people, so that they could infuse the enthusiasm and passion that, that my organization needed so I can focus on other things. There's nothing wrong, sisters and brothers, for us to move on. That we love our organizations enough like Dr. Saeed loved Isna and he moved on. That doesn't mean that he's going to stop doing the work that he does. You will still hear Dr. Said. He will still be on platforms. He will still be doing the work that he did. But he knew that the time came for him to move on and give his space to somebody else, to, another, to a woman, to another young person. So I hope that Dr. Said sends a message to all of us in this room who are on boards of organizations, who lead organizations, that sometimes moving on is the best decision that any of us could make for the institutions that we come from. Let us encourage our young people. Let us make them the leaders of now because they are the leaders of now. And let us integrate them in the institutions that we have created because guess what? We need them now more than ever. We need their talents, we need their energy, and we need their passion. So thank you, Isna, for all the work that you do for our community. Thank you to all the leaders that are here in this community. Uh, congratulations again to Dr. Saeed. And again, I'm so honored to have given this lecture in honor of a great woman and, and being a woman in this community and for us to sit on the stage and honor the legacy of Hajjah Fazia is, re Razia is really important to me. So thank you and thank you to the family.